Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. So, we're going to start. So, um, today we're going to pick up where we left off last class, again, talking about how we're actually going to execute queries. Um, and so, in last class, we discussed, uh, we, we mostly discussed query processing models. And it's part of this is deciding, like, what is the sort of shape and the amount of data we're sending from one operator to the next in the, in the query plan. And then, what is the sort of the, the control mechanism that we're going to use to tell one operator to execute? All right, and was, the distinction here was the push versus pull. Again, bus hub is a pull-based system. We're going to be primarily focusing on push-based systems. And then we talked a little bit at the end, how do you actually represent the output of predicates and filters, uh, either a selection vector of offsets or position list, or a bitmap saying what tuples are, got satisfied. So again, going forward in the semester, we're going to assume that uh, in our conceptual system we're, we're, we're building as we go along, it's going to be a vectorized push-based system. Now, vectorize is, 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 is pretty much every OLAP system now does vectorize. Push base, it's, I don't actually know the number, maybe less than half is push base. Still, a lot of systems are still, still pool base. But the, one of the key advantages that we talked a little bit at the end about push base system is that you essentially have this like, centralized scheduler that has complete control of what, uh, what tasks are going to execute and when. And this allows you to do. Uh, have fine-grained control over when things actually are executing. And so there may be situations where uh, if, you're, if you're running out of memory because too many queries are running, you can just pause the, the, in a push-based system because you just stop executing tasks. Right? You, stop, you stop scheduling them. Or if you have another, uh, if you have a, 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 an operator that needs to go get something over, over the network, and that's a blocking call, you, you just can deschedule that, uh, that task and then you know, fire it up again when, it, when, it, when it's available. Right? So push-based model uh, allows more control over exactly what's going on than, than a pool-based approach. But again, so, so not every system is going to be push-based, but almost every OLAP system today will be vectorized. All right, so today's class, we're going to continue where we left off last time, talking about how we're actually going to run queries in, in parallel, the different types of parallelism that we have, and essentially how we're going to architect the system so that we can allow multiple operator instances to run at the same time either within the same query or multiple queries uh, concurrently. And then going forward, starting next week, we'll see how we actually start parallelizing the individual operators within, these, within the query plan. Then we'll talk about what the operator output looks like. Uh, then we'll talk, like, in terms of like, how do we reference uh, other parts of a tuple, like other columns, uh, whether we put everything together or do late materialization. We'll talk about how we actually, what the data is going to look like going from one operator to the next. And the spoiler is going to be, we're going to use Arrow for this, how we evaluate uh, expressions. And then we'll just do a quick preview of what adaptive query execution looks like. But we focus on the, in the context of the Velox paper you guys read, we'll focus on how, how we do predicate evaluation and let that be adaptive. But then going forward throughout the rest of the semester, and then when we talk about the query optimization, we'll see how we do uh, query ad adaptivity. And this is, this is the, this is the hardest one. This is one of the hardest things you can do in, in, a, in a database system, and you kind of need to design this data system at the very beginning to be able to support this rather than go retrofit it. Mostly on the, on the query plan side. For the expression stuff, you can add this stuff later, later on. All right, so the parallel execution, the idea is pretty straightforward. Again, this, some of this will be a review of what we discussed in the intro class. But the idea is that we want to be able to have our database system run multiple things at the same time to take advantage of, of the hardware that's available to us. Right? No longer are database systems running on these monolith, monolithic machines that have one CPU with one CPU core and no way to talk to other, other machines. Um, at the very least, if you, even if you're a single socket, it's going to have dozens of cores, maybe a multi-socket machine, and then now that's basically a distributed, distributed system, let alone scaling out to multiple nodes. So in that environment, we want to be able to have the system be able to take one query and fan it out across multiple machines to parallelize the, you know, the various operations. All right? And when, when, sorry, question. Multiple machines or multiple cores? Doesn't matter. Yeah. So this question is multiple machines or multiple cores. For all the things that we're going to talk about today, it doesn't matter where it's, it's a multi-threaded, multi-process, multi-node system. It doesn't matter. Right, because think about what is what is a multi-socket CPU, right? You, you have to communicate something. It may or may not be even in the same address space, whether it's multi-process or multi-threaded. Right. So if if 
if you have the communication channel set up to, to distribute things, uh, assuming you're not calling you know, low-level pipes to, you know, to do IPCs to different processes, you can extend that easily to multi-node. Right? And we're not going to talk about what kind of frameworks you could use, but there's frameworks that hide that abstraction. But the network layer adds certain latency, and isn't that a big issue? Does it, though? Nowadays? Okay. Network's really fast. Okay. Yeah. Especially if it's in, in the same rack. Okay. Um, yeah, the CPU is often going to be the bottleneck. The, the things, in the last two or three years, things have flipped. Huh. Yeah. All right, so again, I mean, this is basically what I just told him. The high-level approaches that we're talking about here today aren't going to matter whether it's, again, multi-threaded, multi-process, or multi-node, right? So at a high level, there's two types of parallelism. There's inter-query parallelism, inter-query parallelism. And again, I think we've covered some of this in, in the intro class, but we'll go more detail in each of these. So inter-query parallelism basically means that can I have multiple queries running at the same time in my system, and there's something up above, like a core data or a scheduler, that's responsible for figuring out who runs where at, and at what time. Um, I did some previous work in, the, in this space, and when we looked at existing systems, most of them are using a really basic first-come, first-served policy, meaning when a query shows up, it's assigned some priority based on that, and then it's allowed to run on some whatever resources that it needs. And then other queries that come out later, or come later in time, will get you know will get resources when they come available when the first query finishes. Um, the enterprise systems can do more sophisticated things, like have priorities for. Uh, like individual users or connection strings. So like if you're a user, uh, if you log in with some, some you know, user credentials, or, uh, that you, you'll be given high priority to other queries. But at a high level, it's still doing more or less first come, first serve. So in OLAP queries, they're going to have both parallelizable and non-parallelizable phases. And we'll see what that looks like in a second. But the, the main idea is that we want to keep all our cores, all our resources actually running something. So if there's a point where a query has to coalesce data to a single node, like in an exchange operator, uh, that exchange operator may be running on a single core, so we have other cores available to do other things. And again, this, this scheduler component is responsible for figuring out how to take advantage of, of all those available resources. So we won't go into too much detail in this class about how we want to do this for inter-query parallelism. There'll be a separate lecture on scheduling queries, and then we'll see things like for join algorithms and other things, how do we how do we handle the cases where, where we're distributing tasks across different nodes, uh, sorry, different workers, whether they're in the same box or not, and we need to send data around. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover this in a bit more detail uh, later in the semester. The thing that most people think about when they say query parallelism is intra-query parallelism. And the idea is, again, taking a single query uh, and then distributing across multiple resources and multiple workers uh, running at the same time. And this is the beauty of a declarative language like SQL, uh, that where ideally you don't have to know or care what the, 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 the system architecture looks like, uh, whether it has one node or four nodes or 10 nodes or 100 nodes, it doesn't matter. Because the same SQL query could then be chopped up into different uh, plan fragments or tasks and then let the system distribute it for you. So it's not like you have to like, debug things locally. Uh, when you, when you de maybe debug things locally on a subset of the data, and then submit it to the, the larger machine to run on all the data, you have to rewrite everything. Right? The SQL, in theory, sh should just be able to, to you know, get translated into a distributed plan or, or parallel plan on the system without any changes. So the, there's two types of parallelism. The most common one is going to be intra-operator parallelism through what's also called horizontal parallelism. Um, I think the, the one of the execution engine teams was asking about uh, sort of asynchronous I.O. and doing a technique called vertical parallelism. So we'll quickly talk about what that looks like. I'll say also, too, all of these things are not mutually exclusive. Uh, you can combine these things together, and various systems are going to do this in, in, in different ways. Um, but that, again, the, the intra-operator parallelism is way more common. And then for each of the individual relational operators that are out there, there's parallel versions of all of them. And oftentimes, that, uh, whether or not the operator itself is aware that it's being parallelized or not uh, depends on the implementation. And if it's not aware, then you, can, you will see an exchange operator in a second where you put that above and allow you to combine results with, again, not being aware that it may have got fanned out across multiple tasks. So horizontal parallelism, as I said, is the most common one. The idea is that we're going to break up a, an operator in our query plan into independent instances of them, or operator instances, that are basically going to do the exact same function or the exact same computation on its input uh, as all the other operator instances that it's a copy of, but it's going to be operating on different 
pieces of data, different chunks of data. Again, just think of like a sequential scan. If I have a if I have 10 parquet files in my table that I want to scan, then I could have each operator instance be responsible for scanning just one file. Right? And they run in parallel. I don't need to coordinate the intermediate results across uh, while they're running between them, right? They're they're both independent uh, independent computations. But again, at some point we need to put the results back together uh, for other parts of the query plan or the final output to we give to uh, the application. So we're going to use an exchange operator that's going to allow us to coalesce these results from the different operator instances and to combine them together and then send it off to whoever needs it next. Right? So we'll see this technique uh, used in the Morsels paper when we talk about scheduling in a few weeks. Like, this idea of an using exchange operator dates back to the 1990s. Um, so it's, it's not new, and, but this is basically how a lot of uh, distributed systems or parallel systems are going to operate. Even if they may not call it exchange operator, it still will be some variation of it. I'll show you what I mean in a second. So here's the most basic version of doing exchange. So we have our table here. We want to join A and B. Um, and we have this really simple predicate. Um, so the first thing we want to do is convert this logical plan into a physical plan. And so say we have uh, there's three chunks of data, three partitions on table A that we want to scan. So we could have an operator instance for each of those that it gets assigned to an individual core or worker. And again, whether it's a worker thread, worker process, worker node, we don't care. Lambda function, it doesn't matter. All right, and so now we're going to start building up the pipeline. So we know we want to scan A, and then immediately after scanning some, some, you know, some vector or row group out of A, we want to apply the filter on it. And so again, we don't need to coordinate that filter operation across different, different, uh, different workers or different operating instances, so that can run in parallel. Right? And maybe we want to do predicate, uh, sorry, projection push down, so we'll, we'll, we'll push that down above here in our pipeline, and then now we then feed that into the build side of our, of our hash join. Right? So the, now the output of these three uh, operator instances are now going to feed into this exchange operator. Think of this as like the pipeline breaker for multiple operator instances. So I can't do the, the, the probe side of the join until the exchange operator gets all of the, the results from the individual operator instances. What I'm also not showing is how we're actually building the hash table here. Is it one hash table, three hash tables? Right? Again, we'll cover that when we talk about joins uh, later on. Right? Sometimes it's faster just to build three separate ones, and then do another pass to put, combine them together, which sounds crazy, but sometimes it is faster. Uh, most systems, are, if, they're on the, if they're on the same box, they'll, they'll probably single, build a single one. So you need latching inside of that thing to protect it. So you can think each of these is now, uh, this, these, these boundaries here, this is the operator instance, so this is like the pipeline. All right, so once we have that, then we go now on the, on the other side of the, of the query plan tree. Again, say we have three, three files for B, so we're going to have three different instances that are going to scan B, do the filter, do the projection, and then uh, probe the hash table and produce the output. Right? But now in this case here, assuming we have a single hash table for, 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 our, for our query plan, each of these individual operating instances, each of these individual pipelines, could probe the hash table separately. Right? So you're going to have three, sort of three threads or three workers producing outputs from, from this join here. So I need another exchange operator to take their individual results, combine them together, and then produce the final output to, to the user. Right? So again, you sort of think the pipeline boundary for each operator is it's going to look something like this. Yes? Quick question. Exchange will also be running on one of these uh, cores, right? His question is, will the exchange be running on these, one of these cores? Yes. It'll be, yeah, think of this as like a, uh, an operator instance uh, that's running and keeping track of the inputs that it's getting. And then depending on wh whether or not it actually does any work, right? like in this case here, the exchange operator could just be, oh, I got a notification that we, we've populated the hash table from three operating instances. So it doesn't, actually, it doesn't do any computation. It's just a, a, a barrier to say, OK, now, now we can start running on the other side here. Uh, in the case up here, this exchange operator, it actually wants to coalesce the results. And again, whether or not that's a physical operator that is just taking buffers and putting them to a final output, or somehow we've staged the output buffers in such a way that three threads can write into it at the same time, it doesn't matter. All right, so the, the, the exchange operator I just showed you is what is known as an, a gather operator. Again, so this is like the, these are like the variations of, of an exchange that you can have. Um, and as I said, the gather one is the most common one you'll see in, in most systems. 
Um, and so this terminology I'm showing here, this is, comes from SQL Server, from a blog article from, I think, 2006. Uh, and so this is their terminology, but I think it's, it, it, it clearly defines the different ways they're going to take data in and send data out. So now, again, not every data system is going to follow this taxonomy, but I like it because, it's, again, to me, it's, it seems easier to reason about than just saying, oh, yeah, they're all exchanges, but sometimes things come in you know, one way versus another. So again, the gather operator is just combining results from multiple workers and then producing a single output stream that it sends to somewhere else in the query plan. The distribute uh, exchange operator takes a single input and then fans it out to, uh, to, to, to multiple workers, to whoever, whoever actually needs it. Right? And so you can think of this like uh, when, when we talk about enemy results, but like we've talked about before, like, okay, what if I want to have the output of one query operator be then used as for multiple query operators. Like if I'm doing a like a subquery that that appears multiple times in the query plan, I want to be able to reuse the result for different parts of the query plan uh, in the DAG. So the distributed operator would would allow you to do this. And then the the, the last one is to do repartition. Basically, you have multiple uh, multiple operators producing input to the exchange operator, and then it's going to produce multiple outputs to different different channels. Yes. So I mean, this seems like MapReduce, sure. But who, what came first, parallel databases or MapReduce? Parallel databases, yes. So when would you need the, so the gather scene one seems like the only one that, that I can think of is going to be useful. Why, no. When would you need repartition and when would you need distribution? So instead of repartition, BigQuery is going to call us a shuffle, right? Okay. And so after every pipeline, they're going to do this shuffle thing. And they actually have a separate service Take the inputs uh, and stages them, and then the operators can the operators upstream can then pull from them. And it may be the case that the number of uh, the number of operators, the number of of workers that are that are on the sort of input side might be different than on the output side. So having this like natural staging point, barrier point, you can then scale out, scale in the number of, of execution engines or operators you want to bubble. So this is more along the lines of like if you're over the network one, right? The increase and decrease. Doesn't have to be a network, but yeah, yes. But it won't really happen on a single node. Really. No, so it won't happen on a single node. No, it may be the case that the, uh, like you have a physical plan. And again, we'll, we'll talk about additivity in a second. But like, like I have a physical plan and, and I have some optimizer, optimizer estimates with like, here's the amount of data I expect to get from these operators below me. And therefore, I know how many operators I'm going to need to process it above the exchange operator. But what if those estimates are wrong and you like, uh, woefully underestimate it. Mm -hmm. So even on the same box, you may want to scale this in and out up above. And the, shuffle, the repartition the shuffle operator allows you to do that. OK, so the other question I had was, other than uh, table scans, right? Uh, uh, maybe you have a slide about this, but which, which, which other function, which other operators could we, uh, could take advantage of this stuff? Because uh, it doesn't seem trivial doing this for every operator. Uh, so, so the statement is, are there other, what type of operators would you have, could these be? Yeah. Anything. I mean, my last slide, uh, in this case here, yeah, this is the, this is coming from the scan, you do a bunch of stuff into it. Right. And then I'm showing the output of the join goes into the exchange operator. But what if there was something above, up above? Like, what if, what if this is like a nested subquery, and then there's something else that wants to use it up above, uh -huh. right? Yeah, yeah. Again, the relational, relational algebra, relational operators allows us to be, compose these things in any way as we want. So the question is, is it always a one, maybe another way to say it, is it always one-to-one -one inputs to outputs? Yeah. Or could you make duplicate of the output? You yeah. could duplicate the output, right? As I example I just said before, what if I want to be able to reuse yeah. some, some, some nested query computation? Well, you know, I have a thousand tuples coming in. Logically, I have a thousand tuples coming out, but right. physically I maybe have you know, double that because it's going to do two different parts of the query so plan. Does that change like, the distinction of like, is it, are those just all considered repartition? Uh, are they all considered repartition if you do that? Because um, it, like, it seems like it would be a logical difference between, oh, I'm cloning like, the data uh, to different places. I mean, you, you could do that with this one too, right? Oh, uh, 
I guess another, way, maybe another question is like how how much computation is actually going on here? Yeah. Like, could you like like is it like sorting? No. Uh, could it do? Um, well, actually, it, like, could it be like sort of like, like it, it like maps like this specific like amount of like the third operator to like the first thing thing out? It's not a good idea. Yeah, that, doing that would be a bad idea. So yeah, you're just, just taking a bunch of things in and like okay, I'm just gonna randomly decide which way, which way it goes. You're not randomly deciding. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this would be equal. Uh, sorry? It needs to be equal, right? Like, I mean, like, mean the amount of work that goes to each one? Yeah. Ideally, but you can't, always, you can't guarantee that. Right? So like, again, think of this case here. Think of like, I take some input in, and then I'm, I'm going to hash it on some key, and right. then redistribute it based on, the, on that hash key. Right, right. So in that case, again, if, if I recognize that everything's skewed and it's all going to this operator, mm -hmm. then maybe I want to do like, another round of hashing and, and redistribute it. Hey, but that repartition uh, uh, operator is running on one single load. So if you no. No, not necessarily. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, again, BigQuery, again, this is like, we'll leave at the end of the semester. BigQuery is going to run a whole separate like service that just does shuffle, that just does this. Right, right, right. Okay. So really, it's the specific implementation of this specific repartition node that, that determines it. So there's no general. Yeah, so the question is, like, like so, OK, this is PowerPoint. There's boxes with arrows going in, right? I'm just giving the idea that like you could have three inputs in, and then two inputs coming out. It could vary. That logically you could build this, right? I'm sorry, you, you could build this based on this logical idea, and the sophistication of the different implementations are, are going to depend on the various systems. BigQuery, they they fabricate hardware to make this go as fast as possible, right? Microsoft doesn't do that. Other, other people don't do that. Other people actually don't always. You know, BigQuery is always going to do this, and it gives them. You know, it seems like it would be expensive, but it, it opens up a lot of opportunities to to adaptivity later on. Okay, so um, again, you can obviously see how this is just a ge this is just generalization of the other two, and and I'm saying repartition again. This is Microsoft's terminology. Google is going to call it shuffle. Dremio is going to or BigQuery is going to call it shuffle. Uh, I forget what Databricks I think Databricks might call it shuffle too. Um, if, from Matt Reduce to the Hadoop world, they would call this shuffle, right? But the I idea is is more or less the same. And the question is again: the statement is it didn't isn't just copying MapReduce all the way around. MapReduce is copying databases, <laughs> and I have a paper that talks about that. <laughs> yes, we can take that, we can take that one, that one offline. All right. So uh, the last type of parallelism is interoperator parallelism, and the idea here is that within a uh, within a single query plan itself, we could have multiple pipelines running at the same time. Um, and you sort of think of this like an asynchronous model where you have one pipeline always running, but it's producing tuples, and that tuples get fed into some other operator, sorry, some other pipeline that's always running as well, right? And so you, you may still need to exchange operators to combine enemy results from the different segments, um, but if your query plan allows this, and not all of them do, you could you could get better speed up because now like you don't have to run one pipeline, and when that's done, then switch over to another one. You can start you can start running higher parts of the query plan as soon as you have have tuples. Again, when it's allowed. This is sometimes called pipeline parallelism. You'll see this mostly in the stream processing systems, which we're not going to talk about this semester. Um, examples of that would be uh, I mean, the Spark streaming, uh, not Samza, Pulsar is another one. Uh, there's that one guy who, used, who came here for a year. Um, Rising Wave, right? Um, there's a bunch of these systems that are designed to do this. Kafka is, is, is probably the biggest example of this. Yeah, I, I, I blanked out on Kafka. Kafka is the big one. All right, so say we have this, again, this unusual query. All right, it's basically a Cartesian product across uh, four tables with, like, with no, no where clause. Um, and so in each of these, I can run the, I can run each of the pipelines just at the same time. This one up here and the two ones up here are going to be blocked waiting for whatever comes out of, the, of these two down here, right? So as this thing is running, it's sending tuples up, and then it can immediately start doing the join on, on other things once, once it's available. Right? Because again, Cartesian product, you're trying to match everybody with everybody. So there's no, you won't have any false, 
you won't have any uh, false negatives because you're just waiting for things to come up. And as soon as it comes, you can start matching it and producing the output. Again, this is a stupid example, but it just gives the idea that you could run these things at the same time. And you're just, it's a producer consumer model. This thing's producing tuples that it sends up, and then that guy's waiting for, it, for those results. But again, th this, is, this is not that common. Okay. So now let's talk about the, the paper that I had you guys read. Um, and the, the reason why I had you guys read, read the Velox paper is because, um, as I sort of mentioned in the, the second lecture, or the first lecture, um, that you know, there's this trend now where people have recognized that the, like an OLAP execution engine has uh, sort of become a commodity. And that there really hasn't been groundbreaking uh, uh, you know, changes in hardware that requires to rethink how we want to, want to build everything. Certainly there's optimizations and improvements over the years, but at a high level, like it's a vectorized push-based system, well, that's what Snowflake, you know, invented in 2013, 2012, and that's actually what the, the, the Moni, X, MoniDB X100 system was doing uh, back in the day, or they, they weren't doing push-based. Um, so there's a bunch of these different products that are out there that are all more or less doing the same thing, and you can sort of think of now, instead of if you're going to build a new system from scratch, although we are doing that here as part of the, you know, part of the class, like instead of having to, to, to build all the low-level details you would need or the functionality for, for an execution engine, it'd be nice if there was just something, something off the shelf we could use that could provide this, this basic functionality for us, right? And so that's the idea of these sort of these, uh, these composable libraries for building database systems and that you could, in theory, instead of building everything from scratch for every new environment, every new workload, whatever, you can just use these things and modify them, extend them for whatever the hardware, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the application you want to support. So the Velox one is probably the most famous one, again, out of Meta, which we'll cover in a second. Data Fusion, we're also aware of, which is part of the Aero project, which is, I don't I feel like it should be a separate thing, but that's another story. There's this OAP thing from Intel. Polars is another one, where again, they're all just trying to be these, these libraries you can plop down that are execution engines. Yes? We'll get that in a second, yes. His statement is Data Fusion includes a front end, Velox doesn't, yes. But it, you don't have to use their Data Fusion front end, you could just use the execution engine, right? Okay, so Velox is, uh, is again, came out of a meta. Um, and what I liked about the paper, they talked about how the original motivation for this was they looked across the entire organization of, of meta and they saw people just you know, reinventing the wheel over and over again, building these custom execution engines that were at a high level were all doing the same thing. And it was a, a bunch of wasted, wasted effort where everyone's trying to do the same Snowflake style optimizations to all these execution engines. And they would end up having different semantics and understanding and data types and other capabilities. And it'd be really hard to sort of transfer any, any one, from one workload running on one system to another system. Or the one example he mentions in the paper is that they, they did a survey and they found 12 different implementations of the substring function uh, in call, all of meta, where sometimes they, they started with zero, sometimes they started with one, sometimes they took null, sometimes they threw exceptions, like everything was completely different. Um, and so they were trying to unify this or having sort of Velox be this, again, this low level, uh, this you know, execution engine library that could, you could extend for the different categories of workloads or different environments that, that you want to support across meta. And then have you know a small team make that one really really fast instead of you know random people can, trying to re, re, reinvent the wheel. Um, so as he said in Velox, it's not a you know it's not something you just plop down and immediately use. There's no front end. It does, there's no SQL parser. There's no query optimizer. There's no metadata catalog. There's nothing to keep track of what tables you have. It literally is like just just the execution engine that implements the operators. Um, they have a little bit more things that can do the, uh, they have some memory management, thread management, they have connectors to read data from, from, different, um, from different sources. But I mean, at the core, the, the, the really thing they're trying to optimize is essentially again, running these operators in parallel, in a vectorized manner. So the input is going to be a physical plan, a DAG of operators, and then it's going to produce some output wherever you tell it to, to go. And again, it's not like you just you know, it's an executable you can run, you have to build this in the context of, of a larger system, right? So for all the systems we're going to cover throughout the semester, we'll try to do this quick summary to say here's the core features that they have, 
again, and then you have this mental checklist and say, okay, I, I have a high, high level understanding of what they're actually doing. So when we talk about Databricks Photon and Snowflake and other things, we'll try to do the same things. Like here's the key things that they have based on everything we talked about this semester. So Velox is gonna be a push-based vectorized query processing engine. Um, they're gonna use pre-compiled primitives and cogen for expressions in C++. Again, we haven't discussed what this is. That'll be the, the paper you guys read uh, on Monday next week. But again, just think of like the think of like the for the you know for the scanning a table where you know a column is going to be in thirty two. They have a compiled version of that. They have a compiled version for floats and all the other data types. They're going to support compatibility with Arrow, which we'll cover what Arrow looks like in a second. Um, they have some uh, support for adaptive query optimization, not the full pl query plan uh, reoptimization that we'll see later in the semester. But they can do some little tricks as you're running and scanning along data to modify how they're going to evaluate expressions and so forth. And then, as far as I know, at least when I looked at this before, they only support sort merge joins and, and hash joins. Again, there's no query optimizer. There's no, uh, there's no networking layer. All of this is, is, has to be provided by whatever the encompassing system that wants to include, uh, include Velox. Again, as he said, Data Fusion has more of this stuff. Uh, but even that's not meant to be a, a full complete system. So as part of this, again, because it's not a full complete system, Velox is not, doesn't have its own proprietary data format. It doesn't own any of the data, similar to this, this data lake architecture we've been talking about, where we assume there's a bunch of files somewhere on S3 or whatever object store you want, and they'll have connectors that allow the scan operators to go retrieve that data and process it, but it's, it, it's not meant to be the, at least the library by itself can't control you know, the ingestion of data and so forth. Like something else has to manage all that. So they're going to def the the APIs that Velox provides expose have the capability to define connectors that allow you to retrieve data from other systems. So connector is a very common term that's used in different systems. Like you type in it, your favorite database and type connector, you'll see different you know uh, they'll see what kind of kind of capabilities and support to talk to other things. So the the one that's probably the most extensible is like Trino or Presto, which Presto came out of Meta as well. But they have connectors to talk to any possible database you would want. And the idea is like it's a, an API within the system that allowed you to go talk to some other system, whether it's a database or a file system, and then pull data in. So you sort of basically like a federated database where you make one logical database talk to multiple physical databases. And a connector is how they all do that. If you're familiar with Postgres, the foreign data wrapper API is, is the similar thing. DuckDB calls them extensions, but the, the term usually called is called connector. And then they have adapters that allow them to decode and encode the different storage formats uh, that we talked about so far. So Parquet, Orc, Dwarf is the extended version, eternal version of Orc from, uh, from, from Meta. And then Alpha, I think I mentioned before, this is something that the, the Velux guys are building, um, but the, the next version of Orc. So there's a bunch of components that he talked about in, in the paper. Um, some of these you've already covered, some of these uh, I want to spend time on today, right? So the type system, they're going to support scalars, so they're complex nested types. The vectors that they're, they're going to operate on are going to be arrow compatible uh, with some extensions, although some of the, I think the extensions they've added uh, are now in uh, the mainline arrow codes. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how much overlap there is today or how much distinction there is between the two of them. Um, they have the ability to define functions if you want to have uh, like your own version of substring or whatever you want that's not in the built-in uh, Velux library, you can extend that. Then there's the engine that actually runs the operators, which we've, we've covered a lot, connectors we talked about, and the resource management would be like memory pools, basically a buffer pool to keep things in memory uh, and, and pull things out as needed. So for today's class, I wanna, I'm gonna talk about these three things, because we've already talked about the type systems in the context of a parquet. Uh, function API, again, it's just, it's almost like a user-defined user function allows you to say, here's, you know, here's this new capability, capability, built-in capability, connecting different, uh, connecting different uh, from different storage devices or whatnot. That's not really new. And the resource management stuff we'll cover throughout the semester. Yes? Oh, okay. I, I was just going to ask him more of these. If you can cover to it. Like, what's, what's your question? Uh, is that, is there, are there any trade-offs related to doing that, uh, doing the whole uh, memory pool stuff? Or is it always a good idea to have a uh, separate your memory into Uh, your question, his question is, is it a good idea to manage memory inside no, the like in the way they do? Uh, with arena pools? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Because what's the alternative? Well, I don't think Rust has something like that, but that's, that's all. You don't Rust? For buffer pool? No, no, not for 
was feeling the debt for the way that you approve, uh, you they approach the whole direct Wait. IO. Yeah, not direct IO. No, no, no. So you said Rust, like the query, like the programming language. Yeah, but it doesn't let you do it something it is something similar to the way they have. That's what I was asking. Uh, I mean, this is like a this is a layer above the programming language. This is like it's, it's a system, right? They, they have to manage memory. But it's also like a C plus plus constraint in the sense that you need to manage memory in C plus plus. You don't need to do it in Rust. Is it a good idea to do this? Always. This is this is storage, not memory. Well, no, no, it's it's memory, but. Uh, I mean, the answer is yes. Like, so in, in the Rust is, how do I say this? Rust is just going to prevent you from, like, handing off memory without keeping track of it, right? Right. But, like, that chunk of memory, you want to be able to, like, you don't want it to go malloc every single time, yes. right? You want, a, you want a memory pool. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, it, it, this, this is a layer above the programming language. Right. Again, if it was, like, Java, like a memory management, like, memory managed, uh, uh, query or programming language, like even then you want to avoid like in the JVM you want to avoid their garbage collector. You want to allocate your own memory. Absolutely yes, okay. right. You, that where the data is here, we can we, should, we can do any, anything better than than what the OS can do or what the the, the JVM or whatever can do. Okay. So you want to manage everything ourselves. Okay. So all right, the first thing I talk about is like okay, what is the what is the what do tuples look like? Not in terms of the physical level, but like that's not true either. But like, how are we putting together and sending data from one operator to the next? Not in terms of what the encoding is, just in terms of like, are we including all the data we need or some of the data, right? So the operator output is going to define what is actually being passed up from one operator to the next, whether it's in the same pipeline or not. Again, it doesn't. It matters, but like the. It, it, the data system will be able to decide, okay, at what point do you want to, want to materialize everything? And the, what, how we're going to put things together, it's going to depend on what the processing model is. So in the vectorized case, because we want to operate on columns, we, we don't want to materialize maybe the, all the columns all at once because we, we know we may not need that up in the query plan. Depends on what, you know, is it a row store or a column store? In our case, it's a column store, so we know we want to do late materialization. And depends on what the data requirements are, meaning at what point at what point do I actually need certain pieces of data in the query plan, and how expensive is it going to be to go get it again versus materialize it at the point I'm actually scanning the data file? Right. So let's say in the case here, we want to do this join uh, on RNS, and there's this, you know, the join clause is RID equals SID. So we know that while we're scanning RNS, depending on the number of columns that they have and how wide the table actually is. We know that we, we only need certain uh, attributes from those tables at this point here. So at what point do we actually materialize the tuple so we can do the join or do, do the projection above it? So to do early materialization, the idea is that you, 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 at the moment you're scanning the data, at the leaf nodes and the scan operators or whatever, whatever part in the query plan, you're going to put the entire tuple together. Right? And this is easy to do in a row store because when you scan the tuple, right, ev everything's right there. And even the PAX model, it's, it's, it's all going to be within the sort of same row group and close by, um, but depending again how wide the table is, you may not actually want to put it all together, right? Because that that's not that's not free, right? So if I'm doing this join again on an earlier materialization, then I'm going to stitch together the entire tuple of the two join uh, of, of the join operator and have that be my output. That's going to be sent from this operator to the next operator, right? So again, the idea here is that all the subsequent operators in the query plan never need to go back to get more data because we're passing the entire materialized tuple up above. In late materialization, which is what the VELS people do and, and most OLAP systems do, the idea is that you only want to pass up the, the, the bare minimum number of attributes you actually need uh, in the query plan. And, if, and at any point you need to get more data, that operator has the ability to go down and, and get it. So again, in this case here, doing the join, I only materialize the record ID for R and S, and then like a tuple ID or an offset that says to allow me to go find the other attributes within the columns below it. And so that's what gets passed up here in the, in the, in the query plan. So in case of R, I'm just feeding up the tuple ID and R ID, because that's all I need to do this side of the join. And the same thing here, once I get past the, 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 the filter on value, I only need to pass up the, the S ID, right? To do the join. But now up above here, 
after I, after I do my join, I have RID because that was passed up to me, but then I don't have the, the creation date from the S table. So in this case here, the operator has the ability, says, OK, I need this other, two, I need this other attribute. And it has the, the capability to ask the system to go fetch it for you. And then I can stitch it together. So in this case, you, know, the, you may not always want to do it this. right? It may be the case that uh, the cost of going fetching things from disk again or from, from the object store can be expensive. Again, if it's cash, you avoid that, that I want to, I want to materialize everything early. But again, if I have a billion tuples and the join produces one tuple, then I'm passing along a billion tuples, a bunch of columns I don't actually need. And it's better, better to do late materialization. So this, this is an old idea that goes back to about 15 years ago. Um, I, I don't know whether the first column storage stuff did this uh, in the 90s from Sybase IQ. Uh, but I know Monibi did, DB did this. Vertica did this. Like, this, is, this is an old idea that pretty much everyone does today. Right? And again, we, it's easy to do in the PAX model or the uh, in the PAX model or the, the column store because we can go fetch individual columns as, as needed and put things together. Yes? Suppose you have a really huge uh, query plan and you use a column at the bottom, do you, and it's only ever used again back at the top, then do you drop it for the in-between? So his question is, if you have a, say, really high query plan, a lot of, lot of, you know, a lot of steps going up, and there's, a, there's, a, and there's an attribute that's used at the top and the bottom and nowhere in between, would you drop it and, and add it back? You could, but I don't think anybody does that. Just it'd be too much bookkeeping, I think. Also, too, it depends on like, like. The size of balance books. Yeah, and you have to make, estimate things. It's it's it would be hard to get it right. Yes. Um, I know that like we we know like which context like the materialization versus early materialization is good in, but like in terms of like actually designing systems, do like systems like pick just one or the other, or do you have, like a hybrid approach? And, like, how do you evaluate? So his question is, uh, there's pros and cons of both of these. I'm rephrasing. There's pros and cons of both of these. Um, do most systems just pick one and just use that, or they try to be clever and do a hybrid approach? I mean, sort of similar to what he was saying. Can you try to figure out, like, can you, well, here's an extreme example. Like, can you try to figure out for any query plan, should I use early materialization or late materialization? I think some systems do, the enterprise ones. I don't know about the open source ones. I, like, I, don't, I don't know what DuckDB does. I think probably what is most common is just pick Late, late materialization and to do that because there's less engineering. Okay. So now, so now we know again. We're assuming we're doing late, late materialization, and we know that what we're sending up is going to be you know you know columns of, of values. The it's the bare minimum of what we actually need to process each operator as we go up. Um, but now we need to talk about what the encoding of that data of those columns actually look like. Right? And the challenge here is going to be for these lake house systems, these OLAP systems, that want to read data from a bunch of files on S3, all those files could be encoded in different ways, like Parquet, ORC, whatever, um, CSVs. And that means that you need a way to transform whatever the on-disk representation of that data uh, that you're reading into some common format that the execution engine can actually understand and, and support. Right? You, you, you would not want to say, here's my sequential scan operator or my join operator for, for Parquet data, and here's my, my sequential scan join operator for, 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 for ORC data. Like, that would just be so much, you know, so much code to maintain, it, it wouldn't be worth it. So all these systems are going to translate or transform the, the disk format into some internal representation. Right? And that's what's going to get propagated from one operator to the next as we go up in the query plan. So the, so the internal representation or internal encoding, again, it's, it's, as I said, is how the system is going to represent data on, on the inside. And this may not be what could th is then exposed to you as the user uh, as, as a result of the query. Like it may come out as arrow, it may come out as a parquet file, whatever. But as it's going from one operator to the next, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be different. And so just like when it was on disk, we want our columns to be, uh, the values within each column to be fixed length. Because then we can find the, the corresponding matches across tuples uh, very easily. Ideally, we want to be able to move data uh, and use data structures and move them from one operator to the next without serializing, right? Without having to run like embedder blocks or ran that algorithm to, to like to do three passes to try to encode it. That's super slow to do that while we're actually running a query. So we want something that that can ideally natively operate on the encoded data and move that along without having to deserialize it first. 
Similarly, it would be also nice to have uh, zero copy memory access, because uh, that would then potentially allow us to take our internal representation of, our, of data and be able to sh share that with external processes. Uh, now, this is, this is a new idea. This is actually what Arrow is, is, is originally predicated on. But think of something like, actually, DuckDB does this really well. So like, when you're, you can use DuckDB inside of like Python code, right? And, and almost like a, like a data frames API. And you can, you can access data that's running in memory in, in DuckDB. And all it's doing is just passing a pointer because it's the same process. You don't need to, to serialize it and deserialize it to, to transfer data. And so if you have the ability to have this common representation that everyone could potentially support, then you can do that zero copy memory access. Like that's sort of an extreme example. Um, but think of like, I could send data from, uh, from one node to another node over the network. And if my transfer scheme or transfer encoding scheme is the same as the internal representation of data in my operators, then I don't need to serialize and, and deserialize it as it would with protobuffers. Right? I just send over that data, and then as soon as the bytes arrive on the other node, it just starts crunching them. Even crazier, you can put things down on the FPGA and start uh, on the NIC and actually start crunching on it without having to decompress it first. And there's some systems that do that. So this is obviously leading up to what Apache Arrow is. Uh, and so in the same way Parquet and ORC are defined as open source formats for storing data on files on disk, Arrow is a, uh, is a open source format to describe how to store data in memory uh, in a columnar fashion. And the idea is that it's going to set the, or sort of encode data in such a way that an implementation of something that, that operates on error data will be able to do all the cache efficient vectorized stuff that we're talking about throughout the entire semester. The one thing that is going to be much different than Arrow, uh, sorry, Parquet and Orc is that they're also going to be able to support random access more efficiently. Like I can jump to an offset. Uh, and get the exact value for that tuple without having to maybe decode you know, using RLE or delta encoding, all the stuff that we talked about before. All right, then sequential access just, just ripping through the columns and, and processing things. So Arrow's a lot of stuff. Like it, like it's, it's, a, it's meant to be sort of this framework that comes with uh, uh, memory management, thread management, uh, RPC mechanisms. Uh, they have a SQL parser and a SQL transport layer as well. Um, but what I'm talking about here today is just going to be the, the encoding scheme for, for the columns and the, or the, for the data that we're passing from one operator to the next. Again, whether it's on the same, same box or different box, it doesn't matter. They also have a sort of a, a not simplistic, but a basic expression, uh, expression engine for evaluating expression trees, like simple, like simple filters and projections. So you can't do all of the, the, the compli complicated functions that you would want or could do in Velox. Like you can do really basic things like just something, does this, this column equal this, and so forth. And they actually compile it down into LLVM and then using this engine they have called Gendiva. So errors can be much different than Parquet and Orc. And again, because they want to be lightweight, they only support two encoding schemes. They have dictionary encoding and some variation of RLE. Right? If they're not doing delta encoding, they're not doing the, 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 all the bitmap stuff that BetterBlocks is doing. Right? It's, it's just going to be these two things. And so the, the, the way they're going to do dictionary encoding, at least the original version, was just taking the, all the strings that are in a column, sorting them, and then the offsets are the codes you're going to, you're, you're going to embed in the, uh, in, in the column itself. Yes? Why do they have expression evaluation? Yes, yeah, so, so it, it's there's a there's the there's a specification of what the what the encoding looks like, and then there's a then there's an implementation of it, of being able to operate on it in C plus plus, and so as part of that implementation, they include the ability to do like find the, you know the, find all the columns or find the matching tuples where something equals something, and the way they're going to execute it we'll see in a second. Instead of traversing the tree, they're going to basically compile it down into LLVM. Again, it's hard to say like. I, I, I was debating whether even to mention it because like we haven't talked about query compilation, which is what, next week, uh, and we'll see how you can do this for expressions in a second. But like, there is, again, it's more than just the spec. There's, there's a there's an implementation library for it as well. All right, so I should have talked about this earlier when we when we talked about uh, data encoding um, of how you actually want to represent strings. 
And again, the again, strings of variable length, you want to convert them into to fixed length values. You can store them in your, in your columns, right? But then what are you actually storing for that value in the fixed length column? And then what are you actually, you know, where are you actually storing the, the, the variable length string? So what ERA originally did was the, the fixed length data would just be a, uh, a size and a pointer, so 12 bytes. And then the pointer would just be an offset in some blob region in, in, in memory. And it just pointed what, what byte offset you would find the string that you're looking for. So the column, the column would be this, this, this data up here, always 12 bytes. And then this other variable length thing that has, has the, the actual strings itself. Right? So it didn't matter what the string was. You were always using, using this scheme. So in Velox, in the paper, they talk about how they extended Arrow to support uh, this additional storage scheme that's based on, uh, based on something that the Germans did. Um, and we'll just call that German string storage. So the idea is that if a string is small, uh, so it's, it's always going to be 16 bytes instead of 12 bytes. If this, so you always have the, in the header, you have the size. And then if the string is small, you'll store a four byte prefix um, in, in, in the first four bytes. And then whatever the remaining data is in the remaining eight bytes, pad it out to zeros. But if the string is larger than this, the, in the prefix, you still have the size, you have the prefix, but then you have the pointer now to that, that blob area where you have the, the actual full string itself. So even though, in this case here, you have the prefix here, you're still going to store it down here because you don't want to have to like, you know, stitch things together when, when you're scanning things along. You just jump here and get, get down to everything you need, right? And so this is, this is a really simple idea, but this makes a huge difference because now in some cases or some queries, I actually don't need to follow the pointers. Like if I'm just trying to find all the strings with the, with the start with the letters A N, I can rip through my column that, is, that are always going to be 16 bytes and just do the, you know, do the pattern matching on the prefix, not even follow the pointer. Right? Where in the case of above, I, I don't have anything in my fixed length data. I always got to follow the pointer. Right? So we get another way to think about the, the pointer, like that's the, oops, sorry. Like this thing here, that's the dictionary code. The pointer is the dictionary code. Right? Right? And there's, I mean, in some cases here, like you can do, it, there's times where you, again, you don't even need to follow the full string to do some computations, whether it's filtering, uh, aggregations, and other stuff. You can just look at the prefix. And so I talked about this last year, and I, there is no name for this technique. I've just been calling it German, German style string storage. Uh, and then other people start using that term too, right? So this is from the Arrow people. Which says, you know, last year, six months ago, I mean, this is in October, that says Arrow can't do German style string storage, uh, literally some of the same slides, and then he shows the PR where this, this comes out. But then someone messaged him afterwards, like, hey, what, what is German style string storage, right? <laughs> uh, and this is the paper from the Germans for Umbra, uh, where they, they invented the technique. The Germans do amazing stuff, like, well, I said this before, like, they love to pack, uh, they love to pack, like, bloom filters and other things in leftover bits in different parts of the system. Like for hash tables, uh, even though they're 64-bit pointers, in x86, Intel actually only uses 48 bits. So they take the remaining 16 bits and they put a balloon filter in for your, in your hash table. So that, that just checks to see whether the key is going to exist in the chain that comes after that. So you can look at the balloon filter and not even follow the pointer. Right? So similar idea here. They do amazing stuff. All right, and then this actually came out two days ago. The Polish guy. They have a new blog article, so now they're, they're using this, uh, using this uh, format. And of course, somebody's asking again, what does German style storage actually mean, right? <laughs> so this is my fault. Um, so, all right, so this is the Umbra style string storage, or Neumann style string storage, okay? Um, DuckDB does this, uh, Velox does this, Polars does this, uh, Umbra obviously does this. I don't know what the Hyper did, right? Um, all right, so you know, this is a really simple technique, and it, it's a huge, huge win. Um, yes? Uh, so suppose you want to do an exact string map of, say, five or more bytes. Then do you do like a two-pass thing where first you like, filter out everything that's not matching, and then do the, go to the pointers? Yeah, the question is, uh, if, you, if you need to match when you need, uh, say you need all five bytes, uh, or in, or the first five bytes instead of four, uh, would you do a first pass, look at the prefix, figure out what matches, then, then within that do a pass on this? Uh, probably yes. I actually I don't know what Polars does and the other ones systems do. Um, it would make sense because in that case, uh, you could rip through the column, figure out what you actually need to look, look at, 
And then in that case, also too, you, you, would, you would avoid duplicates, right? Because like, again, think of this as like, I could have multiple, if multiple tuples are sharing the same string, then the pointer would be the same, so I could just coalesce them. I have to do some bookkeeping to figure out, okay, which ones actually match to the same thing when I, when I pass off the results. Um, but yeah, that would probably would be a faster way to do that. Again, assuming that there's enough overlap. But I, I don't know what people actually implement. But it, it, it's, it's a good optimization. Yes? Is this pointer like an offset or what? This so question is, is this pointer an offset? Uh, yeah, so it would be... It'd be a, it could be an offset or within a, some, again, some blob region in memory. I don't know what error stores, I don't think it's a, yeah, an arrow, I know it's like a, it's like a, it's like a bucket number then an offset within the bucket because they have different buckets for, for the variable length data. Okay, yes? But, but in Bellix, it was just a pointer. I think Bellix was just a pointer, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I, in the, in, I was looking at the arrow spec, and it's a bucket. Um, because in, in, again, think of like you're sending stuff over the network. You don't want to have to deserialize it. In, you know, so like if you're if it's just a logical pointer, then you then it, the physical memory address doesn't matter on the other side. All right. So German style string storage is really Umber style string storage. Um, okay. So I don't want to talk too much about this. I just want to mention it really quickly. We, we mentioned substrate before. Uh, this, is a, this is not directly related to Arrow, but think of this as like in the same way that Arrow is, is meant to be the, a, a universal file format or universal encoding scheme for transferring data across different systems. Um, substrate is meant to be a open source specification for how to represent query plans, uh, relational algebra query plans. Um, so in in like, I mean, Data Fusion and DuckDB, I think they have the ability to take these substrate query plans and actually, and actually execute them. So the idea, you know, the idea seems great. Like it'd be something like I can take a something like CalCite or some some query optimizer as a service, service, have it produce substrate, and then if my system can then operate on that on that query plan, that's the you know I, I can just take it and run it. Um, I can have these things a bit more decoupled. So this was created by the guy that that did. Uh, Apache Drill, which is a, a open source clone of BigQuery from Google, and then I think he also co-founded Dremio as well. But now he's I think, focused entirely on Substrate. Question? Sorry. Okay. Um, again, I so when I talk to some of the Arrow people at, at Voltron Data, the problem with Substrate is that it's for really simple things it's, it's okay, but as soon as you start you, you start extending it, going beyond what they expect. And it, and it causes problems, um, and I think it's, I think it's just one dude that's like doing it. Whereas like arrows, you know, rather large consortium. I think substrate is mostly, at least it was at the time. It's just one dude doing this as like as like his hobby now. All right, data fusion we mentioned multiple times, and again, the, the, the branding seems kind of weird because like it's a part of the Apache Arrow project, but it's it's almost like this own entire separate thing. Um, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if this thing gets forked out underneath the, the Arrow umbrella and becomes its own standalone top-level project in Apache. But the, it's basically like Velox. It's a, a, a vectorized execution library for operating directly on Apache Arrow data. It does include a query optimizer. Uh, it does include the you know, SQL front end. Um, so it's a bit more, it has a bit more features than, than Velox. But at its core, if you don't want any of that, you could, you could just take their, their query engine. Um, so there's already a bunch of systems that are that are based on this. InfluxDB is probably the, the biggest one out of all these. Um, this is their third InfluxDB's third rewrite, uh, and now and there's a, that's a long story. Uh, but they had the original version 1.0, and then they switched. They got off SQL, and I told them it was a bad idea, and they added MMAP. I told them that was a bad idea, and that was version two. And then version three, they got rid of MMAP, they added back SQL, and now they're based entirely on on Data Fusion. Um, SarasDB, KnosDB, I think they're out of um, out of China, and then CFAL, I think these guys are, um, oh, they just got acquired uh, by Enterprise DB like, like two or three weeks ago. I think this is a data fusion uh, execution engine that's designed to run inside of Postgres. Anyway, so, so, so Arrow is, you know, Arrow has sort of become the de facto standard, like Snowflake supports it, like this, this is, a lot of systems are based on this, and then data fusion is, is one implementation of, of an engine that can operate on it. 
All right, so I want to finish up talking about expression evaluation and, and then sprinkle a little bit of adaptive execution. Uh, and then that'll then set us up for talking about vectorized uh, execution next week. So expression evaluation basically says, how do you actually take what's in the where clause or join clause or the predicates and evaluate them on the data as we're scanning or, or doing our, our executing our operator? And so at a high level, you can think of like the, the, the parser is going to, you know, the, the SQL parser is going to take whatever's in the, in the SQL query and convert it into a tree, an expression tree that looks like this. And every node's going to represent some operator or operand within that expression tree. Like, so you have for your, your conjunctions, disjunctions, less than, greater than, not equal, so forth, all your arithmetic operators, constant values, references to tuples within, or a column, and then additional functions. And you basically translate the the, you know, what's in the SQL query into a tree like this. Now, whether or not you break up like the join clause into in the where clause to the separate trees or put them together or how you break up within the, um, you have nested queries, like all of that is left up to the implementation, um, but it's always going to end up looking like a tree structure like this, right? And so how would you, actually execute, you would execute this? Well, in the naive way is that for every single tuple, as I'm scanning my, my data, I'm going to traverse the tree. Right? To do this, you know, I would start with the and, go down this side, evaluate these things, pull it up, see whether it's equal, go down the other side, and, and do that comparison. But obviously, that's going to be super, super slow because it's a bunch of indirection now. I'm, 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 I mean, jumps and following you know, pointers in you know, virtual function tables if it's in C++. Like, running this, it's sort of a naive case, which BusTub does use, uh, would be super slow if you're trying to scan through a billion, billion tuples. So, what we want to try to do instead is represent the expression in, and as, as if it was like a function call for, in the, you know, within, within a programming language. Because now we can hand that off to a potential compiler, and whether or not that's the query optimizer or a you know, traditional programming language compiler like GCC, you know, it can do all the, the standard tricks that we, we know how to do in compilers for the last 50, 50 years, right? So, Say we have a really simple query where you know select star from table, or I'm, miss I'm missing the from calls, uh, where s val equals one, right? Again, we have an expression tree with equal clause, s val, and constant. Well, ideally, we want to have a function that just takes in value as an input and checks to see whether it equals one, and have just run that function in, in every single tuple. And so we could then compile this now again using our favorite compiler into actual you know, machine code, and then now as we're scanning along a tuple, we just invoke that function instead of traversing the tree. So that's what that Gandiva thing I mentioned in Arrow, that's what they do. This is what Postgres does when you turn on the JIT compiler. Um, this is what a, a lot of systems actually, actually do. Yes? Right, so it's clear to me why this is faster, right? Yes. But why is it that traversing the tree is precisely so slow? This question is, Go back to Vicazil. Why would traversing this tree so slow? Yeah. So think of like I have a, in my operator, my scan operator, that all I have is a pointer to some root of an expression tree. And to make it composable or, or, or generic, it's going to be a, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a, you know, an abstract class. So I'm going to invoke like you know run you know, run function on this expression operand, and that again assuming it's C++, that's a virtual function table to look up to see what's the actual function I'm calling. Then inside of this operand, I'm going to have two pointers, left and right. I got to call those pointers. Same thing, virtual function table look up, then you know execute this thing, then go down, and now I'm copying data up. Right. So that's what I was thinking is that you have like just uh, so much interaction between nodes. Absolutely. Yes. But His statement is, what if you do something like a B plus tree and store everything as one big chunk? What do you mean? Like, instead of having, um, instead of having to do, instead of, having, instead of having the full pointer direction, having all the nodes mount to different places, you could have the entire tree as like, the same way a B plus tree is faster in that uh, like every level of the tree is. Like you could I store the in order traversal in one chunk of memory, right? Yeah. Or flatten it, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what Velox does. Yeah. Well, I thought they did this for a compiler. I mean, sorry, the expression compiler. They flatten it and then they, 
the, 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 well, see in a second. Velox has a experimental compiler that will, com that will then convert it, like the Gendiva and Arrow. The Gendiva thing and the Velox one are separate. So Velox is going to flatten it, as you say, then you, sort of, you, you run along sequentially, right, along the leaf nodes, right? Um, Postgres, again, if, if you're not doing the JIT compiler, it'll traverse the tree. My SQL traverses the tree. But a lot of systems do that. And obviously, that's terrible for OLAP. But again, in their world, they're operating on, on a single tuple for most of the time, right? In our world, we want to operate on columns, a ton, ton of data. So not only do we not want to traverse the tree, uh, we want to make this, whatever this thing, we, we, we convert it to the, the actual like a function call. Instead of passing a single value, we want, we want a vector of values. Because we'll do the check a trillion times, right? You do what, sorry? Because you're going to do this check a trillion times. So. Oh, yeah, so we're going to invoke this function a, a, a billion times, a trillion times, yes, yes. And so we, we can vectorize this. And it always goes back to what, again, what we'll talk about next week. We talked about it a little bit on, on Monday this week. I can, because you know, I only have so many data types in my columns and my constants, like instead of passing, instead of having one hard coded, I could pass one as a constant value here. And I would have a, a version of this check function, a quality check for in 32, in 64, floats, and so forth. And, I, I just, and I'm just picking at runtime which of those pre-compiled functions I want to use, given a vector, given some constant, you know, return whether it's something equals something. And this is different from query compilation, right? The statement is, is this different from query compilation? Yes, the query compilation I, will, will differentiate between holistic query compilation, where I'm compiling the entire query plan. This is just compiling the expressions. So you could still have an interpreted engine, uh, which, which Velox does and what uh, uh, most systems do. But then within that, when I call expressions, those are pre-compiled, pre-compiled primitives. And as I said, we, we want to vectorize everything. All right, so in the case of Velox, it's, it's the example that he said, I wouldn't call it the B plus tree, but I, I'm sure there's a, there's a compiler term to this. You're basically flattening down the tree so that you just execute things sequentially, right? And then you can start to think of like what you're actually executing now. Function, you're making calls to function pointers uh, that are pre-compiled, as I said. And because we're operating on vectors of data rather than single attributes within a tu single tuple, then that amortizes the, the jump cost of going to that function. And there is an experimental branch that is at being actively maintained in Velox, but I don't think it's turned on by, by default, that can convert the <coughs> The flatten expression tree, or, uh, uh, yeah, fat, flatten expression from the query plan into some IR that they then convert to C++ and do a fork exec to co compile that in GCC, right? Which is slow because again, it's like I'm I'm synthesizing C++ code in a file, then I fork exec GCC, which fires up all the processes. And GCC is going to do a bunch of other, you know, initialization stuff on its own, like it's going to check config files and other stuff, right? Then then it compiles your code. Um, that's what the, you know, the first version of single store memsql back 10 years ago, they would do the same thing. And of course, in some cases, the compilation cost of the query could be like seconds. So you would only want to do this kind of compilation stuff if you know that the query is going to run for a long, long time, and that will negate the, the, the compilation cost. Like if your query is going to run for 10 milliseconds, your compilation time is 500 milliseconds, that's not a fair trade-off. So you got to be careful when you actually do this. And same thing with Postgres. Postgres, they'll have they have an estimate for how long it's going to take the query plan to run, how long it's going to take to actually JIT compile something, and they don't always JIT compile everything. All right, so even without, without this compilation step, though, into machine code, Velox does some additional optimizations that I think are, what, are kind of cool and worth discussing. So um, the one they're going to do is constant folding. Um, so the idea here is that if you know that there's some operation you're doing over and over again on some constant value, uh, then just do it once memoize it or re retain it, and don't repeat it. Question, yes? Yeah, um, I was going to ask, like, because, like, like, barring the use of UDFs, right, like, with these, like, common expressions that are like, just composed of, like, you know, the simple operations between them, that, like, anyone looking to, like, building, like, a lightweight, like, compiler on an UDFs that just, like, only, comp like, has the capabilities of compiling these expressions? Because I don't think that would be too complicated. This is, like, L1 of compilers. So his question is, uh, has anybody considered basically embedding a compiler in the data system itself and using that to compile like everything? Not, or? not everything. Like it would be like limited to just the simple expressions that are like no UDFs, because UDFs like make things really awkward. Yes, yeah, so ignore UDFs. I think we're saying something optimizing. Like constant folding everything is optimizing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could do that. 
So this is where I'm getting at. Like, what, the thing I'm going to describe to you, again, you, they, you learn in a compilers class. But in the case of Velox, they're re-implementing that. Uh, and then the lines get blurry of who actually should be doing these optimizations. Should it be, should it be Velox? Because it doesn't have a query optimizer. Should it be the query optimizer up above? Or in your case, could it just be the compiler itself? So there is a system out of Germany, uh, same school as Umbra. She's not German, though, but she's at the German school, called LingoDB, where they convert a query plan to this thing called MLIR, which is similar to Substrate, but think of like, you know, meant for more general purpose programming. And then they run Clang or LLVM compiler on that, who then does all of this stuff as well. So yeah, people, people have done this. Um, but I think it, I don't think any commercial system is doing exactly what LingoDB does. Yes. The difference from like uh, generating, let's say, C++ code versus generating like LLVM, IR versus like, is there any difference versus generating like exactly the same code? So his question is: Is there a difference between generating LLVM, IR versus generating C++ code? Let's punt on that until next week. So we'll look at uh, we'll look at an early system called, system called HiQ that did generate C++ code. It said MemSQL did that. There's, there's, there's pros and cons to this. Obviously, it's going to be slower than just generating L of my R. On the other hand, if it crashes, you have C code you can look at and figure out what went wrong. So we'll, get, we'll, we'll come to that later. But to his point here, like I'm you know, here's how to do constant folding expression tree. That's compilers 101, right? So I'm calling this, this uh, upper function on the constant Wu-Tang uh, to do my comparison against the column, but I'm doing that over and over again for, you know, for every single tuple. So obviously, I can just do it, do this once, and replace it with Wu Tang, and and then now I don't have to run it again. Another common thing they do is, is or at least in Velox, they do common subtree elimination. So if you recognize that you have the same subtree in your in your expression plan or expression tree that you're running over and over again, so running string position on on a column for a given attribute for a given constant, then I can just do it once, and then it's going to link up the this operator here to get the result from whatever comes out of this thing, right? Again, as we said, the, the lines are blurred between who's actually doing this. Should it be the, the, the execution engine, something like Velox? Should it be the query optimizer should be doing this? Um, in the case of like, the, if you're having a standalone query optimizer, uh, it might be kind of hard to do the constant folding thing, right, for this function, because now you need the implementation of the upper, of the upper function. So either you call the system that you know, you know you're running on and say, hey, here's upper, give me what, what the result of this, but that could be slow, right? Or you'd re-implement it yourself. CalSci re-implements some of this stuff themselves. Uh, data fusion just calls data fusion. I don't, I don't know what Orca does from Greenplum. In case of MySQL, I know that they, for these kind of things, like within the optimizer itself, if they see that something they want, like a, they want to do this constant folding thing or other, they want to you know what's the value for this, this, from this operation on a constant, They'll convert some subset of the of the where clause into a a, a table of select statement within the optimizer. Go run that query, get back the result, and then inject the value into the query plan, right? And you can do that because MySQL can do that because it's tightly coupled. But again, if you're trying to build these things as separate standalone services, that'd be hard to do. You'd have to have to have an API to support it. All right. So the last thing I want to cover is the this notion of of adaptivity. And the idea here is that, we're, though we haven't talked about query optimizers yet, I mean, again, from the intro class, you should be aware of what they're actually doing, right? They're taking a, a SQL query plan, sorry, a SQL query, converting it to a physical plan we can actually then run on, on a system. And the way a, a good query optimizer is going to do this is through cost model estimates, right? Trying to, trying to predict the selectivity of every single operator to determine how much data they're shoving up from one operator to the next. They can use this to determine join ordering, right? And so, for all the optimizations that we've talked about in this, this semester, like all that is, is a complete waste of time if we're given crappy query plans, right? If we choose the worst join order that we could possibly have, then it doesn't matter whether we're vectorized, you're doing compilation, we're running on like fancy GPUs, hardware, whatever. All that gets thrown out the window because we have the you know crappy query plan. So we need a way to be able to be resilient, a robust. Uh, have the execution be robust enough that, like, even if we are given a crappy query plan, we can tweak things and make changes as we go along to try to improve the, our situation. The challenge here, the, and you, you may say, okay, well, okay, well, I'll just make sure I don't have crappy query plans. The problem is, again, in, in a lake house environment or a data lake environment, you may not have any any statistics about your data. 
Like someone uploaded a bunch of Parquet files in S3, and then you're told to go run select queries on top of that data. You've never seen it before. How can you actually start producing estimates? Right? Or if you use one of these connector things that talk to, you know, have your, your Lakehouse system talk to Postgres, Postgres may not expose to you its, its internal statistics, so you have no idea what you're actually reading. So we need a way to adapt the query plan while it's running based on the data that, that we're seeing while we're going along. And this is what adaptive query processing allows us to do, right? We're allowed the execution engine to make decisions on its own without maybe consulting with the query optimizer, some cases you do, some cases you don't, to either modify the query plan structure itself, right, potentially changing join ordering, moving thing, projections up and down, or changing the expression tree while the query is running based on the, the data we're seeing. So the idea is like similar to in better blocks, they did a little sampling to figure out here's the data I'm about to encode, then use that to make a decision of what the best compression scheme to use was. While the query is running, we're seeing, we're seeing the data. So we can start making estimates about what the real selectivity of, of our predicates or whatever we're doing is on that data, and then decide whether how to how to modify our execution plan. In the extreme case, we just say this is all garbage. We're, we're, these estimates are way off. Give up. Throw away all the results. Go back to the query operator and say, "Try again. You did it wrong. Here's some new new results." And in some, and it seems crazy, right? That like, why would I stop a query, throw away everything, and go back and and try to run it again with a new query plan? Well, again, the, the worst query plan can can be orders of magnitude difference between the best query plan. So it, it is actually worth uh, to go do that. Very, very few systems do that. Uh, most of them just take whatever, you know, whatever you're given and, and run it. Um, and I think only in, in academic systems will, will, will they be this, this you know, just, just completely give up. Um, so we'll discuss how to modify query plans later in the semester. Today, I just want to focus on like, what tricks we can do to make the expressions uh, evaluation go faster. And so again, all the, the major OLAP systems that are out there, the Snowflakes, the Databricks, the, the Dremels, the BigQueries, um, I think Redshift as well, they're all going to do bits and pieces of this. They're, I don't think anybody really does this one, get throw up or th th throw, throw it away and go back and try again. Uh, but they'll do some of the things that we'll, we'll talk about here. Um, but I'm going to focus on, on the Velox ones. All right, so the first trick Velox is going to use is called predicate reordering. This is, this is an old idea that goes back to the 1990s. It's a paper that did this in Postgres uh, from a long time ago, um, actually from Joe Hellerstein, who's now the uh, database professor at Berkeley. But the basic idea is that if I have, say, two functions in my where clause uh, that I need to run, I can decide in what order I actually want to run them. And there may be the trade-offs between the how long it takes to compute one function versus how long it uh, versus the selectivity of, of, its, of its operation. So you decide maybe I want to run the slow function first because that's going to be able to filter out more tuples uh, than the faster function, right? And then as you're running, you can decide in, you know, how to change the order as you go along based on what the computational time would be and the selectivity would be, right? Common prefetching, the idea here is that uh, if within my operator itself, I need, say, two columns, but so I can start scanning one column and maybe do the first half of my expression tree and, and, and rip through that, but then I make an asynchronous uh, I.O. fetch call to the storage service to go fetch the second column. So I can start ripping through the first column, then in the background it's fetching the second column. By the time I finish the first column, then I, I can then start scanning the, the, the second one. Right? We talked about how to do prefetching before in, in the intro class, but that was like prefetching individual pages. This is like within, within for individual columns within my, uh, you know, within a single operator itself. The, the no, not in all fast path, this technique basically says, if I recognize that the, the null bitmap or the, that's being passed up from, as, as my input to my operator, if I do maybe like a quick pop count and identify that there's zero nulls in my, in my column, then I don't need to do null checks. And I just elide that, that process entirely and I have a faster version of whatever the, the operator that I, I want to run or expression operand I want to run. When I showed the Postgres numeric code, there's a bunch of null checks in there. If null, then do this. If not null, do that. Right? We, that's all going to be indirection. That's all going to be cause branch misprediction. So if I know there's no nulls, throw that away entirely and run a faster version. Similarly, you can also do, uh, you can avoid additional checks for string data if you know everything's ASCII. 
So again, ASCII is the, I guess the original encoding scheme for, for how we represent strings. But obviously, that's been extended to UTF-8 to support different international languages uh, and larger character schemes like poop emojis and things like that. Um, so, but if you know all your data within a column is going to be ASCII, you don't have to do the more expensive uh, UTF-8 uh, UTF check, right? So in the, in the Velox paper, they just show that like, if, you, if, you have, if you compare the cost of running different string functions on the UTF-8 version versus the ASCII version, right, it's, it's ordered magnitude difference between some of these functions. Right? This is a really simple check. So you may, the idea is that you always run with the UTF-8 one first. Then if you recognize that you're scanning, hey, this is all ASCII, then you, you just run the ASCII version. Right? And, and if you get it wrong, abort and roll back. Yes? So other than the predicate reordering, all the three of these are something that you do while, not while you're running the query, but something that you would know about the query itself. Right? There's no nulls in this one or there, you know, that you can run ASCII. No, 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 no. You, you don't know anything. So, while I'm running it, I'm just seeing ASCII characters, so I assume that only ASCII. Is that how it works? Like for this one here, like I'm running, like so, so I'm given, hey, here, here's your string column. Uh -huh. All right, and I, I don't think Parquet and Orc tell you whether it's UTF-8 or, or ASCII. Uh -huh. Just, or they, see, it's not even Parquet file. It's a, you're parsing a, a, a log file or CSV, yeah. right? So if you recognize that, hey, this is all ASCII, I can run the faster ASCII version. But I need to see some of it a little bit first to okay. make that decision. Okay. Yeah. That's the basic idea. Yeah. So I, I think they have a fallback mechanism for this, I think, if you're wrong. How do you recommend I think for ASCII, uh, well, if, you, if you see something with like a, like a one bit set. Yeah, 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 yeah yes, yes, yes. Like one, then, well, then, like, yeah, ASCII is supposed to be backwards compatible with UTF-8. But with a null, still you can't do that, though, right? With what? With a null, you can't do that. Like, if you have a null and you're running the no null fast class, Yeah, but, like, but you, you, like, you have the null vector ahead of time. Right, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so you you just do pop count. Is any bit set to, at the one? If no, run the not null. All right, we're over time here. Sorry. Uh, one last trick I want to show is like they also have the ability to, which I like, is if you recognize that the the whatever operation you're trying to do in the expression tree on a string data is can just overwrite whatever data you're given. Again, think of like I've, I have my original data files. I've converted from parquet to arrow. Now I'm just passing around memory chunks from one operator to the next. If I recognize that. Oh, I can just overwrite the memory of, of, this, this, of this column of this data with whatever the operation I want to do on it. Uh, I don't have to, re I don't call malloc or allocate memory to put new output in. So again, if you're running that upper function, all that's doing is just taking the, the characters you're given and uppercasing them. You can write that back over the original, the original value and, and reuse the same buffer that you then sent up to the, to the next operator, right? So they show like if you do the if you do that trick you you shave off another uh, you know another another twenty five percent nearly twenty five to forty percent on your runtime by re to use the buffers right so this is the baseline using the UTF version there's the ASCII version and then you get even more using uh, using reusing buffers that's a nice little trick I like that all right so just to finish up so today's lecture was basically a quick overview here's a bunch of stuff of how to design your execution engine. Uh, and I'm sort of trying to show you, here's the broad categories of things you have to think about. What, the, what kind of parallelism you're going to support, how you're going to move data from one operator to the next, what that data is actually going to look like, how you're going to evaluate expressions, and what tricks you can do to optimize them. So I'm not saying that everything I showed you today is, is, the, is the complete menu of what's available to, available to you, but now you need to understand, here's the things you got to think about when you build one of these engines. And again, I, it's, it's my opinion that Arrow is going to be the best choice for internal representation. Is it perfect? No. Are there improvements to it? Yes. But it is actually involving. Like they added the German, the, the Umbra style <laughs> string storage. They added that last year, right? So it, it's not stagnant. OK, so next class on, on Monday, we're going to talk about now how do you actually run the, the operators themselves in, in, in a vectorized manner using, using SIMD. So the paper I assigned to you is from the Germans. It's basically. A, a, a deep dive into how to use AVX 512's features to, to optimize and vectorize you know, relational operators. OK? All right, guys. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the unusually warm weather. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle because I'm more a man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got sore cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No 
no short with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause ain't eyes and said, the pain I've read. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. We gon' get you some same knives and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, the talented weak guys. Be a man to get a can of snake eyes.